video I ever make. It sucked really bad. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. When you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Dave. So today's episode is going to be about the flathead catfish. I hope you guys enjoy it. We're going to go over diet, migration patterns, and lack thereof, habitat, general behavior, reproduction. We're going to talk about how big these things get. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about the world record. It's a possible controversy surrounding it. So stay tuned. So let's get right into it. Pilodictus olivaris, otherwise known as the flathead catfish, virtually unchanged since the mid-Miocene, approximately like 23 million years ago. There's not a lot of fish out there that are spoken with the same reverence that flathead catfish is. Uh, these things pretty much terrify everything that swims in the same waters as it does. Because they have giant mouths. So which waters are these exactly? Well, here's a picture of their native home range. Again, this is their native home range. So uh, this is where they're supposed to be and not supposed to be anywhere else. Uh, and as you can see, they go all the way from Minnesota. And unfortunately, the good maps were copyrighted. So you get this one. But those good maps actually extended all the way down to the very base of the Yucatan Peninsula. So these things go pretty far south. All right, this next picture, this is a picture of their new current home range and as you can see they're now east of the Appalachian Mountains and west of the Rockies and pretty much blotched everywhere generally because they're an amazing game fish and people want them there now a lot of these things are still considered uh, to be invasive however there's a lot of them that were purposefully introduced so they want them there I mean it's not like the first time right are we there yet no so their diets are pretty much everything in the water. Common prey items are things like sunfish, crappies, all forms of black bass, uh, channel cats, other flatheads, blue cats, freshwater drum, buffalo, all forms of carp, red horse suckers, blue suckers, white suckers, all forms of pickerel, shad, shiners, creek chubs, black bullheads, brown bullheads, yellow bullheads, soft shell turtles, snapper turtles, loons, ducks, ducklings, aquatic mammals such as muskrats, anything to find itself pretty much unfortunate enough to have fallen into the water with these things, such as squirrels, cats, smaller dogs, children, whatever. I was just kidding about the kids, but I think so. Moving on, smaller flads typically feed on things like insect larvae until they're about four inches long. From that point until about 10 inches, their diet expands things like crawfish and smaller fishes, so like little, little tiny bait fish, things like fry and minnows and stuff like that. After they reach about 10 inches long, however, they pretty much shift to an all fish diet at that point. Some interesting stomach contents I was able to find were uh, baby alligators, rats, crows, cotton mouths, copperheads, water snakes, plastic toy soldiers, condoms, duck feet, shrews, moles, plus a three pound channel cat still attached to a stringer. Let's talk about flathead in season. I hope you got your butt kitchen and your tinfoil hats on because we're about to stir the pot. There's going to be some items in here. They're going to be mildly contentious among the group. Typically takes place in late June, early July. However, it's not uncommon for some of these fish to spawn all the way up into August. And this usually takes place around thick structures such as logs, large boulders, uh, undercut banks, and just areas of generally just large debris. Ideal water temperatures somewhere between 75 and 80 degrees. Uh, I found a lot of things that said between 70 and 80 degrees. I even found some that said between 75 and 85 degrees. So uh, we're just going to go with 75 to 80. It was a nice conservative number. So here's probably the most interesting aspect of flathead reproduction. The females lay about 1,200 eggs per pound of body weight. So in essence, a 10 pound flathead is going to lay about 12,000 eggs. A 50 pound flathead is going to lay about 60,000 eggs. Uh, many of the larger flatheads, however, uh, there was a lot of biologists that, that observed them laying as many as 100,000 eggs. So 40, 50, 55, 60, whatever. A lot of these flatheads are actually laying almost double that number. So th this is probably the greatest area of contention amongst the flathead community is about the, do we keep the big ones? Do we keep the little ones? Which one, what do we do? I, I mean, I hope that by reading this, you guys get some understanding of why Certain people belong to certain camps when it comes to keeping fish, not keeping fish, what fish to keep, which ones not to keep. Males reach sexual maturity between three and four years of age. Females between four and six years of age. Once the eggs are laid, the male fiercely guards the nest uh, for typically like six to seven days, sometimes as many as nine days, and then the eggs will hatch and the male continues to guard them ferociously. Meanwhile, the fry will typically school up 
and this will take place for several days and the male will continue to guard them and then after a couple of days the baby flatheads will basically disperse on their own and the male just dips out Peace. next item up is the growth rate now i actually spent a lot of time pouring over this data it was unbelievable Okay, I didn't think I would find anything. And if I did, I thought I was gonna find a whole bunch of websites that said, oh, yep, two to five pounds a year. Or yep, three to four pounds a year, three to five pounds a year. That's not what I found. I didn't find that at all. Here's what I did find. I found two studies. I'm gonna talk about the first one. And it was the most in-depth study that I found. And it was from 1953, conducted in 18 Oklahoma lakes and rivers by some biologists there that work for the state. And after reading their findings, the flathead growth rate is not as simple as you might think. It's definitely not as simple as I thought it was going to be. And by the way, it took me six hours to look over this data and finally make sense of it. It was on a really old typewriter and the letters were blocky and blotchy and it was hard to read. But here's a picture of the first part of it. So basically at the end of the study, uh, they were able to conclude and I was able to ascertained from their conclusions that the first three years of a flathead's life, they don't grow very much. They grow about a pound and a half in three years. So if you catch a flathead that's about a pound and a half, it's probably about three years old. Subsequently, after that, until about five or six years old, so once you've gone from three to about six, that number jumps up between two and two and a half pounds per year. So after about six or seven years, that's when we start to see the huge changes in growth rate. They can even grow as fast as seven pounds per year. But your typical growth rate is gonna be about five pounds per year. And subsequently, their length is the exact opposite. So when they're small, in terms of weight, they grow very slowly, right? But they're in, their length grows very rapidly when they're young. And it slows down as they get older versus their weight that increases in growth rate as they get older and is very slow in the beginning. So I thought that was very interesting. So there's three main deciding factors that determine how fast flatheads grow. The first one is mildly contentious, even amongst the scientists that did this data. And that was average annual water temperature. Now there was absolutely no information, no evidence whatsoever that bore out that this factor had anything to do with growth rates in flatheads. It just didn't it just didn't bear out in the in the data. It just didn't exist. But they knew that average water temperature had to play a role because we know that flatheads don't grow in water below 70 degrees. That's when the vast majority of flathead growth occurs is in 70 degree or warmer water. So what they concluded was that there must have been other circumstances and many of them might have been small that added up that somehow made up for this to where you just didn't see it in the data. And some of those other reasons are genetics. Now in the 1953 study, they did not use the word genetics. They said characteristics passed on by the parents. And the third main factor is an obvious one, which is available food sources. One factor that was actually highly requested when I put this topic out there uh, was what are the growth rates between flatheads and rivers versus lakes or reservoirs? Both studies concluded the exact same thing, zero. There's absolutely no difference between the growth rates, flatheads in rivers, streams, or lakes and reservoirs. Those flatheads didn't grow any faster or any slower. So lakes and rivers, doesn't matter. They grow the exact same. So do these things migrate? Well, whew. according to the data, they don't. Also, according to the data, they do. What's really interesting is there's several dozen of these studies out there. And uh, it, it's almost like a 50-50 even split where half of them conclude that no, they do not. And the other half conclude that yes, they do. Subsequently, when these are peer reviewed, the biologists all came to the same conclusion that they're both telling the truth. They both are good science and they're both good studies. And it just seems that some flatheads do and some flatheads don't. For instance, uh, there was actually some flatheads in Minnesota that traveled the farthest out of these studies was 65 miles. So there was, and there's definitely a correlation between the northern flatheads versus the southern flatheads. The northern flatheads do seem to have a tendency to migrate by definition. Now, when we often think of migrating, we think of things moving like hundreds, maybe even thousands of miles, but that's not actually what's going on here. 
they're moving like between 40 and 60 miles to a wintering hole. And these, and again, I'm talking about the flatheads that live far to the north. The flatheads that seem to move the most and had the most regular movements that it was year in, year out, were the flatheads that were living in the Missouri River and in its subsequent tributaries, as well as the upper Mississippi River and its subsequent tributaries. Now, on the flip side of that, so several of the studies that proclaimed that they did not migrate at all said that flatheads typically don't move a half a mile from a specific log jam. Like they'll live their entire lives on a single stretch of river that really doesn't exceed something like 30 acres. So it's like a half a mile. So in conclusion, some flatheads migrate and some flatheads don't. I actually ran across a really interesting story about this topic that I just, I had to share with you guys. There was a in fisherman, writer, and contributor. His name was Neb Keedy. I hope I'm spelling, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, it's K-E-H-D-E. -E. But he interviewed a man named Tom Burns. And Tom Burns was a commercial fisherman in Kansas. And he chased after flatheads. He actually called them muddies. That was the name he had for them. Uh, he spent 60 years chasing flatheads from 1931 to 1991. That is a long time to be chasing a fish. And he did so year round. He proclaimed that in the 1st of May, the Call River would come alive with the channel cats from the Missouri River. And this typically signaled the beginning of the channel cat spawn. And he said basically what they would do is they would swim up out of the greater uh, Missouri and go up into the call and, and so channel cats were absolutely migrating in this region and then subsequently around mid-June the process repeated itself but with flatheads following virtually the exact same route he told several interesting stories and to me the most remarkable one I mean they were all pretty fascinating but one of them was from I believe it was 1954 where he had come around a river bend on a sandbar and the sandbar was about the size of a football field and he said it was about two feet across from one end to the other all the way across the, the river and he said there was flatheads on the surface rolling around he, he actually called them muddies rolling around for as far as he could see i mean wouldn't that not be a sight he actually his exact words were uh it was awe inspiring but he said that up all along the sandbar he said it almost looked as if they were playing with each other and they were just rolling around on the surface in about two feet of water and he actually stuck his oar down in the water just to see what they would do and he said one or two of them would come up and just slap the oar really hard as if to like knock it out of the water but then he said the whole time they're meandering down the river or, or excuse me up the tributary and he said once they got past the sandbar and they got into deep water he expected them to disperse, but he said instead what they did was they literally got into a single file line between 18 and 30 inches wide, and they went in a single column up the tributary, and they stayed on the surface the entire time. And what they would do is anytime they would come across a nesting area or an area that some of them wanted to nest at, and they would just peel off. And he said he followed them for as far down the river until they all disappeared basically just peeling off two, three at a time to go spawn. I mean, that is a, that is a remarkable sight if that was true. He also made the claim that, that from June 18th to June 25th that year, he was able to put 125 flatheads in his boat during this time. So I feel like this is a good time to talk about the whole uh, flatheads and rivers versus lakes and their behavior and what they do in general. So I'm going to read you guys a quote. Chasing flatheads and lakes was more arduous and mysterious than what the legendary musky men of the north have endured. This was said by an old reservoir hand who was interviewed by none other than Ned Keedy, he who is an in fisherman contributor and writer. So in my endeavor to find information about this subject, it was virtually fruitless. So I didn't find any useful data. And not because nobody cares. I did learn this. Uh, it's because only a few biologists were ever willing to risk their careers attempting to answer a question that may not even have an answer, may never get an answer for it. One thing they did conclude uh, was that they were dealing with a rivering creature way out of its element. Uh, and this seemed to be a common theme with all of them, that, that they, it was obvious to the biologists at, that were studying this after any period of time that they were dealing with a creature that didn't really belong in a lake and didn't really belong in a reservoir. 
In the mid-90s, a couple of biologists from Oklahoma using only tracking devices that were embedded into uh, several dozen flatheads, ranging from 2 to 47 pounds. And the study lasted uh, two years, and giving out weekly readings concluded only basic information that, that pretty much just mirrored other studies about their total distances traveled. Not exactly revealing, but this is really the only information that they got. Now, I find myself in a pretty unique position where I chased flatheads for 25 years in a river. Uh, and now, for about the last five years of my life, I've been tracking them in lakes. And I can tell you, you're dealing with a different fish. You're not dealing with the same fish. This is a fish that is more like a ghost. If you just know what to look for, you can go from literally log jam to log jam, dropping baits down for 5, 10, 15 minutes at a time, nothing, pack up, move, go to the next one. You're going to get lucky. That's about as consistent as it gets for flatheads. In a lake, it's not that. I can't tell you how many times I left in the middle of the night completely humiliated. They're a different fish. So if any of you guys are having the same problems with them in lakes, absolutely leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear your stories. We can talk about it. All right, moving on. So how big do they get? Well, believe it or not, even this subject right here is a matter of some contention. And it's not because we don't know. Well, theoretically, it's because we don't know. Uh, but th there's some controversy surrounding the world record. But not only that, but there's, there's some controversy that's really surrounding uh, flatheads in general. I mean, they're such an enigmatic fish that we really just don't know enough about them. And there's one big problem that we have is the largest certified flathead that we have on record isn't even the world record. So what is the world record? This is Ken Polly. Ken Polly is happy. Why is he happy? Because the fish he's holding right there, that is the current all tackle world record flathead catfish. This fish was hauled in on May 14, 1998 from Elk City Reservoir in Kansas. It was a whopping 61 inches long, which is absolutely terrifying for a flathead catfish. And it weighed approximately 123 pounds. None of that is in question. However, some of the things that are in question are some of the comments and remarks that uh, Ken Pauly made during his only interview he's ever given. Uh, so we'll talk about that later at the end of the video. So what about this fish? It was caught on the Arkansas River in 1982 on a snag line. Now if you don't know what a snag line is, a snag line is basically a trot line with hooks a little bit closer together. Fish swims into it, gets wrapped up in the hooks, and it gets stuck there. That was perfectly legal at the time in Arkansas, so it was a totally legal fish. However, it did not meet what the IGFA says it needs to in order to become a world record. It has to be caught on a rod and reel, and there's some other stipulations. We'll talk about that later. But this fish weighed 139 pounds and 14 ounces. That is a whopper, okay? Think about, I mean, that that's almost 20 pounds bigger than the current world record. So, and, and the other interesting part is we really haven't caught any fish between the current world record and any other fish that's been caught in the last 20 years. I mean, there's been a few that have eclipsed 100 pounds, but there's really, there, you know, where's the 110? Where's the 115? Where's the 118? Where's the 121? Where's the 122? Where's the 123? Now, there was one flathead caught in Tyler, Texas, and I forget what year it was, but it was it was 122 pounds. But that's still, you're, you're still almost 20 pounds ahead of the last guys. And then all of a sudden we, we had this other flathead that's 20 pounds ahead of those. So it's really interesting. It's like, where's all the fish in between? It kind of makes you wonder if the next fish that pops up is not going to be 160 pounds, which is very interesting that I would say that because here's another picture proclaiming just that, 157, caught out of the Trinity River. Now, we have absolutely no information about this video. No one does. And if they do, I hope they come forward. I would love to interview these people. We don't know the year. We don't know who it was. We don't know anything. Now, I spent about 45 minutes looking at both of these videos, or excuse me, looking at both of these photos. I tried to gauge where's this guy standing versus where's that guy standing? Is that guy taller? Is he probably not? Are they the same size? And I realized I, was, I wasn't looking at the right thing. I was just, the right thing to be doing is just, let's just try and get a baseline and say, okay, let's just imagine that both these guys are the same size, right? And we're going to line them up right next to each other, and they're both standing the exact same distance away from that fish. They're, they're both standing behind the fish, which is good. And you can conclude that that fish on the right is, is a very large fish. It's a very large fish. I, I would say that that fish is 100 pounds. Is it 157? It's hard to say. How old is this photo? I don't know. I'm not a photography expert, but just looking at it, it's got crinkles. It looks like it's been sun-dyed or 
it's sat in a basement or something. I don't know. It doesn't look like it's in the best of shape. It probably just sat there for 50 years until Grandpa died and then somebody found it when they were cleaning out the attic. And here it is. I don't know. Tell me what you guys think in the comments below. So let's talk about the controversy that surrounds the world record flathead. Oh my God, who the hell cares? Well, there is no controversy. Ken Pauly hooked it. Ken Pauly caught it. Ken Pauly turned it in. Ken Pauly's the new world record holder. Now, I will notice some discrepancies. Uh, in the only interview he's ever given, he did tell the person that uh, it didn't fight very hard, okay? Which, I mean, you can imagine the whole catfish world, like its entire head turns sideways and tail starts to wag, obviously. Uh, anybody that's ever caught flatheads knows that flatheads are some ferociously fighting fish. That doesn't really, it, it just, there's something about it that's off. The other problem with it is Ken Pauly was a crappie fisherman. He was fishing with light tackle and 14 pound test, which is extremely heavy for crappies. That's extremely heavy. Most people that crappie fish are fishing with four to six pound line. Some people eight pound line. That would be like the high end of crappie fishing. Other people that knew Ken Pauly, knew him as a fisherman, said he would never fish with 14 pound line. Again, you just kind of have to throw that out the window because there's really nothing to support it. Because I wasn't there, those people weren't there. We just kind of have to go with, with what it is. One very important factor is this fish sat in a freezer for 10 years. It sat in a freezer for 10 years until some state biologists, some university biologists pulled it out and wanted to examine it. And they did. What they found was a buffalo in its stomach. Now, those of you who don't know what a buffalo is, a buffalo is basically like a carp-like fish, but it's not a carp. There are absolutely no carp native to North America. These things look like carp, but they're not. They're called buffalo, and there's a smallmouth buffalo, there's a black buffalo, big mouth buffalo, and I think there's one more species, but I can't remember. These things are completely native to North America. And reportedly, this buffalo was five pounds, seven pounds, 10 pounds, and 15 pounds. I've heard all four. I have no idea which one it is. All the stories that I was able to, to find about it all had a different number. The problem is that flathead at 123 pounds is capable of eating all four of those fish. Now, that being said, if it was between 12 and 15 pounds, that would have came with a level of difficulty that all flatheads seem to struggle with. If you don't believe me, check out these videos. I'm going to show you a couple quick videos of flatheads doing something that, that almost only flatheads do. There's other fish that do it from time to time, but Flatheads are the reigning kings of this. Okay, so all fish have like a basic relative understanding, a reasonable understanding of what they can safely fit into their mouths and eat. Flatheads seem to lack this reasoning altogether. They will try and swallow and eat things that they have no earthly business trying to eat or swallow. Let's say that, let's say that thing was 15 pounds. That would put it at, at really like the, the top end of what that fish is even close to capable of swallowing. That would have been an incredibly big meal. If you've never seen a 15 pound buffalo, that is a big fish. It is a very large fish. What, what I hypothesize as a likely scenario is this fish just had a really big meal. It was tuckered out from the fight. It, it was tired and it just happened to come across this crappie jig and thought, yeah, that's an easy meal that I can digest quickly. And that was the end of it. That's either way, it doesn't really matter. This is the world record. So that's gonna do it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you take something away from it, whether you've been fishing for 30 years for these things or you've been fishing for three days. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you would, hit a like button, leave a comment down below, and hit the subscribe button. It really helps me out a lot. And as always, I'll see you in the next one. See you.